Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth. This is Collider Movie Talk coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Natasha was simply not attractive enough. I kicked her ass out of here and now I'm in filling in a host today. No, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about today. We've got the new Batman vs. Superman trailer that dropped this morning, which is, you know, blowing everybody's heads off. We got Battlestar Galactica movie news, which I'm super excited about. Sonic the Hedgehog, a whole lot of shit that you can see in the sidebar there. But... I am super stoked right now because as you remember, the other day we talked a little bit of Deadpool. I mentioned it is the seventh film in my career that I have given a 10 out of 10 to based on the pure entertainment value of the whole damn thing. Uh, so I am so excited right now to be joined by the screenwriters as the movie calls the true heroes of Deadpool. We have Red Reese and Paul Wernick. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Thank you thank for having you us. Thank you so much. This I, 10 out of 10 news, I'm gonna do a victory lap around Burbank right now. I'll be great. back. I'm yeah. gonna I go kid take you not, this is, this is my wallet, all right? <laughs> I came out of the press screening last week. I have never done this. Came out of the press screening, got in my assistant's car. As soon as we got in the car, I hopped on my AMC app on my phone, and I immediately bought the first tickets for the very first screening that oh I possibly could. Oh, man. I'm going to go awesome. see it again tonight. Thank I have been you. freaking out about this movie. So look, I, let's start with a couple of, of things here. The R rating for the film. At what point in this process, some people like me speculate, guys, this is going to be rated R all along. But but really, at what point did, did you guys know you got the go ahead to go ahead and make this thing rated R? Well, interesting. When Ryan hired us about six and a half years ago, uh, good and, Canadian kid, by the oh, way. Great. Ryan, Reynolds. he's the best. Um, are you Canadian? I am Canadian. As am I. Oh, really? Toronto, yeah. I'm from Hamilton. Is that right? That I, I left when I was time. I hate four. you, but otherwise, Go America. I lived in Don't Toronto for a while. Yeah. Go America. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Um, when when Ryan uh, hired us uh, and we sat down and really talked about what this movie was, he said, Let, let's write the movie we want to write. And if that means R-rated, then let's do it R-rated. And then we'll deal with the repercussions after. We'll, <laughs> we'll you know, don't ask for permission, you know, beg for forgiveness. And that's exactly what we did. And, and it's why it took six and a half years to make this movie, because we did write the R-rated version. And everyone goes, we're not making this. You can't. Are we allowed to say spoilers? No, not yet. No, I, I, I would, yeah. No, I um, um, so, uh, yeah, we, um, uh, we're, we're thrilled that the studio took the, the, the big giant leap with us and there made was this the way detour, it should be made. Yeah, there was a detour to a PG-13 version at one point, but it tasted a little like Diet Coke compared to Coke. It just <laughs> I felt like a Diet little, Coke. Yeah, well, okay, so maybe that's not the right metaphor, but it just felt Diarrhea? a little wrong. <laughs> uh, it just felt a little wrong, and... We did it in a moment of weakness to try to convince the studio to make it because they had made it clear that R was just not going to happen, at least that regime. And so we, we did it in a moment of weakness. We're ashamed of that fact in retrospect, and we're thrilled that it turned out the way it did. We well, wrote a draft of this film uh, since 2009 in every calendar year up until today. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. Now, I'm going to let you guys know right now. In a few minutes, I'm going to open it up to you guys. If you have questions for the screenwriters of Deadpool, Tweet out a question and just use the hashtag Collider Deadpool. Once again, just send out a tweet and put in the hashtag Collider Deadpool, and then I'll go in and pull out a couple of your questions here in just a couple of minutes. Hashtag but, all screenwriters wear glasses. <laughs> yeah, apparently. Now, I got to ask this. I went in, I was expecting a hard R film, uh, and, and it's magnificent. All, I'm, no spoiler, but I'm just going to say National Women's Day. So. My my. Speaking of National Women's Day, though, I'm watching this movie. International and Women's International Day. International Women's Day. By the way, March eighth. Yeah, don't just limit it to. I'm watching this thing, and I'm thinking, I wonder if they ever had to stop and ask themselves if they're risking an NC-17. Was there ever a moment in your process where you, even you guys step back and say? Wow, we might be pushing this even a little bit too far. Well, I do think the ratings board forced us to take a very few things out. I heard, I heard that. Uh, that yeah, right? that that. So when there we first, was a possibility. But I think there. that's very common with R-rated movies where you push it, and the ratings board they've got to say something, right? They're not just gonna be like rubber stamp, and then you know. So I think they they made us trim a few frames of gore here and there, but. I don't think we ever truly worried about an NC-17. I, I, I don't know precisely wh where, when that kicks in, but I, I, our feeling was always push it as far as possible, and if they if they rein us in, fine. But but don't but don't let don't self censor if that makes sense. Right. So let me ask you guys this: one of the things we speculated about on this show for a long time before even the marketing came out was okay, they're doing R-rated Deadpool. What does this do for possible, you know, universe sharing moving forward with X-Men films and stuff like that? Because obviously X-Men is will always probably be PG-13 stuff. Now we have or Deadpool. Or will it? Or or will it? Is is that something you guys had in your mind as you were developing Deadpool? Or you just say, "Eh, we'll deal with that later." 
Well, we were really our own universe. I mean, right. we, we were the bastard stepchild, you know? <laughs> so, um, a bastard stepchild? Is yeah, that? maybe. Okay. Sure, Red that works. stepchild. Yeah, I, I'm redheaded, so, so yeah. I stay away from that. But, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you know, we just, uh, we wanted to do it the, the way it needed to be done. And, and we're going to kind of figure out how to, how to get it done once we did it. And, and it took us six and a half years to do it. But my goodness. The... Uh, the gags throughout the film. I, I felt like seeing the movie one time, I probably missed a good 30 to 40% of them because I haven't stopped laughing from the previous gag and then something else happens that I didn't hear, but everybody else is around me is, is laughing. How far in advance did a lot of these one-shot gags get put in there? Because this is a beautiful, from a comedy standpoint, the film is a beautiful mixture of callback jokes, uh, longer setup humor, and the one-shot gags. Like just a beautiful mixture where it just kept me as an audience member on my toes the whole fucking time. Like I just never knew what was going to come out. At what point did you really have that balance down or is that something you guys were just kept generating right up to shooting? I think if you were to go back and look at the original script, probably 70% of it's still there. And, and you're right about plants and payoffs. You have to be very careful with that. In order to make them work, you have to and you're often shooting out of chronology. You have to shoot it in one scene and then, you know, three or four weeks later, shoot the payoff and, and have it have it pair up. That said, the, the actors had a ton of freedom to improvise, particularly Ryan and TJ. Those guys are among the greatest improvisers in the world. Not every actor can do that. They can in spades. They're among the very best. And, and the director really took the leash off them and said, and once we got what was on the page, said, okay, let's have some fun, you know, try some different alts. And I think on the Blu-ray, you'll see a ton of different versions of some of these jokes. Uh, one of the things that astounded me about this, I do not like love interests in my superhero movies. I've said, you guys have heard me say this many, many times. Uh, I could buy into the Andrew Garfield Emma Stone thing. They made that work. I've, I've bought into the uh, Pepper and Tony Stark mm -hmm. one a little bit, but for the most part does not work. How did you guys find that balance in make in bringing in these two ridiculous characters, you know, be, between uh, Maria and Ryan, and making us as an audience member care? Because I got to think that had to be one of the most daunting tasks. Because for the movie ultimately to work, not just as a good gag fest, you had to get the audience to buy in into this love relationship, to care about these characters, and you guys did it in the most ridiculous way. I still don't know how you do it, but for you guys, what was the key for striking that balance? Well, it's, it, you know, the love story really is the beating heart of the movie. It allows you to have all the wackiness and, and craziness because you care about these mm -hmm. two characters. These are two broken souls who find each other. And then it's, it's, it really is. It's a Nicholas Sparks movie. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That poster was, was great. By the way, greatest marketing campaign for a film. Oh, the best. In history. Me <laughs> metaphorically, it reminds me of what the Zucker brothers once said about Aaron airplane which was none of the zaniness would have worked if they hadn't had if they hadn't based that movie on zero hour which was an actual disaster film and an mm. actual with an actual real heartfelt plot uh, we felt like we needed a good heartfelt plot of love and loss and redemption and revenge and 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 then we could Add the zaniness is add the zaniness on top of that. For one thing, the structure, which is very zany, it jumps back and forth from present to past. But also the jokes, the the meta humor, all the references to other movies and things. I don't think any of that were, would have worked if we didn't have that emotional through line. Yeah, it really anchored the whole thing. So I'm going to take a couple of questions from our audience right sure. now who've been sending in a lot of Twitter questions. The first one I pulled out here is from Jalen Gitness. And Jalen writes, "The script that is now out and there's the final one for the film. How close is this script?" to the first draft that you guys wrote? Uh, again, about 70%, I'd say. Uh, that first draft leaked online in 2010. You know, they, everyone <laughs> talks about the test leaking online in 2014, but the, the actual script leaked online as well. So people can go back and read that script after they've seen the film uh, and see really how different or how much the same it is. But I'd say, what, about 70%? It, it really, really feels similar. But then again, there were various big changes, like Negasonic Teenage Warhead was not in that first draft, for instance. Um, and uh, Angel Dust was not in that first mm. draft, for instance. So especially some of the minor characters, that, that, that it changed quite a bit. But the, the overall through line, the structure, it's, it's, it's pretty consistent. All right, this one comes to us from Alex Bartz OIM, who writes, 
At what point did you decide to bring in Colossus and why? Was he always part of the story? Is that something you added later? And I'd be curious, what what made Colossus the right X-Men character to bring into this film? Well, I mean, he hadn't been delved into quite as deeply as some of the other X-Men characters in the previous films, which gave us a little bit more of a blank slate to play with, A. And then B, he just he's a great foil to Deadpool in the sense that he's the most square, goody two shoes, nice, good versus evil kind of guy. And and next to Deadpool, who's the precise opposite, it really allows for, for some sparks between the two characters. All right, this one comes from Marchetti Alex, who writes, uh, I love you guys and Collider. Oh, thank you, Marchetti. Thank um, you. Is Deadpool an actual mutant or a mutated human? It's an interesting. I, I don't he, want to get. Let's not get too much into spoilers. Yeah, I mean, I think that the purists would say he's not an actual mutant because his own genes didn't mutate on their own uh, through through a natural process. He had Wolverine's healing factor injected into him, so I think he's a mutated human. All I right, think, Neil deGrasse. Yeah, I, yeah, I feel like Neil deGrasse Tyson exactly. All right, the last Twitter question I'm going to take comes from RVK Movies, and he writes, Was the history and lore of the previous X-Men films difficult or easy to incorporate, or did it not really matter? Well, you know, obviously Deadpool was introduced in, in Wolverine Origins, and, 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 uh, and, and I think admittedly for everyone involved, it wasn't done entirely right. So it was... It was entirely right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a At very all. nice... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, we have a uh, actually that that'll be a spoiler. I don't want to uh, <laughs> mention it, but um, yeah, I mean it, it was an opportunity to to reinvent the character in a way uh, and and reboot him and and really create a, a true origin story. You know, Rob Liefeld, one of the creators of of. Deadpool. It was on uh, our Collider Hero show just last week. He yeah. was here with us for, for an hour. Oh, I watched hours, some of that. Yeah, 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 it was a long, he's yeah, great. yeah, he talked yeah. about any, everything under yes. the sun. That was great. And he paid us the ultimate compliment, and he's like, this will become the seminal Deadpool story. So how it ties into the other X-Men universe, you know, we, we didn't deal with the, really, at all the X-Men universe other than Colossus and Negasonic, but, but in terms of, like, he's his own thing. Deadpool's his own thing, and we wanted to you know, put him out on his own own universe. Well, guys, listen, I, I honestly cannot talk enough about, rave enough about the job that you and your entire team did on D Deadpool. I came out so, I said this uh, on air before, but I have not walked out of a theater that purely entertained oh, since That's like the so first awesome. Avengers film, however many years ago that That's was now. Really I just so great overwhelmed hear. what you guys did with this movie is astounding and I cannot wait to see, not just where you guys take Deadpool next, but whatever it is you guys do next. Oh, Fantastic you. job. Thank Thanks for so coming much, on the John. show I so much. I really, really appreciate it. And that. so don't forget guys, Deadpool opens in theaters everywhere tonight. I got my freaking tickets here, AMC Get Burbank 16. We're I will going. Be there. We're going. Go, you go might check see it us. Out. But hey, also, our own Collider.com, Steve Frosty Weintraub had a chance to sit down with the Merc with the Mouth himself, Deadpool. Let's share a little bit of that right now. Ow! Ah, right up Main Street. Hear the music. We can't allow this, Deadpool. I don't have time for your X-Men bullshit, Colossus. Besides, nobody's getting hurt. That guy was up there before we got here. Can you define your character? Well, she's uh, beautiful. She's strong-willed and courageous. She lives in a dystopian world where people are randomly selected to compete in this um, game of life and death. Also, Donald Sutherland occasionally shows up looking like he just finished eating something delicious. Can you describe your technique? Mm hmm I can. 60% tongue. I'm, this might be an uncomfortable subject, but how does it feel to sell out to Hollywood? Sorry, what was the question again? How does it feel to always be in Wolverine's shadow? How does it feel to forever be in Barbara Walters' shadow? <laughs> oh, yeah. What's next for you? I'm not gonna lie. I got the acting bug right up my bum. I'm gonna remake all of Ryan Reynolds' movies, but with only, only one slight adjustment. 
making them good. Describe your favorite chimichanga. Hot, thick, nine inches long, firm, moist on the inside, easy to grip in less than $8. Next question. Making a movie is complicated. It's a really big deal. Uh, describe your process. Well, my process has always been the same. I start with a single finger, but if I feel like there's room for two more, I just go for it. Man, this show keeps getting better and better, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. We had the writers on with Deadpool. Johnny did a fantastic job. I really did. did. <laughs> I really did. We might keep you around for a little bit. as modest as Deadpool. <laughs> Way to go. Then we actually got to see Deadpool himself be interviewed. And now, my name is Mark. My friends call me Ellis. And I will be running the ship for the rest of Collider Movie Talk, joined by my trusty sidekicks, Christian Harloff. That's me. Um, and I have no computer. Everybody else is cool, so whatever. I got, a, Ram I got a rainbow jacket. You have a on. Chewbacca. Yes, yeah. you have the coolest uh, cup. Yeah, that's a good cup. I like it. And over there would be Dennis Zang. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, Dennis, Christian, John, uh, some other news happened today that we just cannot wait to talk about. Sometimes it happens after we do the show notes, a trailer drops, and my God, did a bomb drop this morning in the form of the final Batman versus Superman trailer. We saw a heavy dose of Batman, and he actually stopped a punch by Superman, and the internet just will not shut up about it. So let's just all gush in the glory of this trailer, gentlemen. John, I'm going to start with you. I'm pretty sure that we're of the same mind when we saw this trailer and that we said oh my god i have turned into a puddle of fanboy goo i okay look everybody knows i believe that the batman v superman trailer number two which is the one they did at comic-con right. last year i ranked that personally as the number one best trailer of 2015 i thought by far and this trailer might be better dear God, look, when that other trailer came out, you know, the show on the, the Doomsday and we all kind of, a lot of people kind of poo-pooed on it. Ever since that happened, Warner Brothers slammed on the brakes. They started putting out TV spots that got the focus right back on Batman v Superman instead of everything else they were doing. They listened. And now this trailer is the ultimate embodiment of them listening. Fuck, this trailer's <laughs> awesome! When Batman straight up does a rock bottom and that one dude punches the guy in the head so hard his body flips over and lands his right on the crown of his head. That moment that Superman throws the punch and Batman blocks it and the look that Henry Cavill played that scene so perfectly because the look on his face <laughs> as he blocks it and he looks like, what the hell is going on? Are you kidding me? And the interaction between Bruce and Alfred at that beginning was perfect. If you're somebody who appreciated the earlier animated series, stuff like that, the, the snarkiness in Alfred's voice towards Bruce, absolutely perfect. They showed us some stuff. And hey, it only took him four trailers. But yeah, you finally gave us one line from Gal Gadot. But I mean, other than that, this I, this trailer was fucking amazing. It was incredible. I, I am speechless. I wish this movie was opening tomorrow. Okay, now, John's wife, Anne, if you're watching right now, make sure you put him to bed for a nap before he goes to see <laughs> Deadpool tonight because the guy's going through a lot today. Now, you mentioned that some people didn't love that Batman v Superman trailer that showed us Doomsday yeah, and yeah. showed us Wonder Woman in action and the three of them teaming up at the end of the trailer. We happen to have two special guests in studio, some of the poo-pooers of said trailer. One of them would be Dennis Zhang. Dennis, I know you're very <laughs> yeah. excited special about- Special guest, Dennis Zhang. And, and, and you're very excited about the tra about the movie, and you've yes. made that clear, but that trailer bugged you. How do you feel about this oh, one? Oh, yeah, I love this one. I, I'm with John where I don't know if I have it, like, better than the, that one from Comic-Con, but it's, it's right up there. I, I absolutely the tone. The beginning shots of, of Batman, you get to see him fight, and not only do you get to see him fight, you get to see how brutal he is, how powerful he is. He's not fucking around, right? He's just taking out people. Um, yeah, with the block of, of Superman and that look <laughs> on Henry Henry Cavill's face as Superman, it's like, whoa, what, what's going on here? They, they didn't show Doomsday, and even the little bits of Wonder Woman they showed, it wasn't too much. It was like, we gotta see that one line. That's another thing. This shows that these studios listen to what people say because this is a direct response to all the complaints that I had and many other people had about that second trailer. They didn't show Doomsday. They didn't show uh, Batman and Superman teaming up. They showed them fighting and they, they heard people saying, hey, we still have not heard anything from Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. So they finally gave us a line. And this is a true story too. I had seen this trailer when Chris and I did morning radio. I'd already seen it. He comes into the green room and he sees the look on my face and he's like, <laughs> what just happened? You saw the trailer. Did you get as excited as we all did? 
yes. Uh, uh, I am. This is a far superior trailer than the Comic Con trailer, I think. Because, really? Yeah, because this is the movie that they were promising us when they announced Batman v Superman. This is everything that I wanted to see in a trailer from this from this movie. It starts out the first thing that they show you is hey I know you guys are used to, to Christian Bale as Batman but watch what our Batman does this yeah. is a Batman that you know it's just a, a just a different actor playing Batman like that is Batman from the second he, he, he goes in there and he's kicking the crap out of all those terrorists and the interaction with Alfred that is the guy and then you go into really what the movie is about for the most part and that's his problem with Superman you see that and yes you have the line from Gal Gadot and you see her fighting but they what, what it was was exactly that they were listening but that last trailer to be clear about I never had a problem that that's what we're going to eventually see in the movie that's fine we just all didn't want to see that in the trailer it. we didn't need to see in the right. trailer everything no. that happened in that trailer is going to happen in the movie and I'm fine with that but everything in this trailer gets me set up for that movie that we saw in, the, in this in the last trailer so I I love this trailer. I actually think it was one of the best. It, and I said to you in our thing this morning that this is a young year, but this is the best trailer <laughs> so far of the year. And maybe if you combine it with last year, might, one of the best trailers I've seen in a very long time because it set this thing up beautifully. And I've been saying that in my anticipated list, it's been lowered down. It jumped up a few spots. It, it was almost tied with Rogue One for me as far as most anticipated of the year. So my excitement level is already at a fever pitch. And it's very rare that a final trailer like this, when we've already seen so much footage, can change the dialogue so dramatically with what we've already been talking about. But that's the case today because it looks like Batman is now an equad to Superman in this fight. And that's evidence, as you pointed out, by him stopping the punch. Watching Batman at the beginning of this trailer, I was a little apprehensive because I clicked on it. And I'm like, I already want to see this movie. I don't want them to give away anything else. I'm kind of happy that they gave this away because we needed that one action yeah. scene to prove this isn't just some rickety old Batman who got out <laughs> of his rocking chair on the porch of Cracker Barrel and decided to get back in shape. This guy's an ass kicker. He's always been an ass kicker, and now he's going up against his greatest foe yet, and it looks like he's going to be on equal footing. It answers the question that a lot of people who are not in the movie space or are hardcore fans, like the casual fan that says, well, how can Batman fight Superman? Hey, we don't sound like that. Well, maybe we do. <laughs> and, uh, I'm just saying. And when, you watch, when you watch that shot as, as just a casual viewer, you go, well, wait a minute. How did he just how do, did that? He do that? It's more of a question of how than he can't because you're showing them. So I think it was a brilliant move to show. There's it. also a little bit of a retcon going in there because in the in the previous trailer, I thought the way it was set up that Bruce was I'm going to run down Superman with the Batmobile. On this one, that's clearly not the case. I can't do he it. He wasn't expecting to see Superman there. He tried to avoid. He didn't want to hit Superman. Uh, he hit hit the brakes. I don't know if because he didn't want to kill Superman or it's because he didn't want to damage his car. <laughs> Maybe it was a little bit of both. But that retcon that just a little bit. But you're right. They're getting back to this is Batman versus Superman and all the millions of nerd voices that cry out in terror. But John, it's also called Dawn of Justice. Yeah, yeah, we know. We know it's also called Dawn of Justice, but that's not why everybody's going to buy tickets. Like we know Dawn of Justice is coming. Like we know Justice League is coming right. and this is the beginning of it. Cool. But we were all excited because it's Batman versus Superman. We weren't excited because it was the Dawn of Justice. We were excited because it's Batman versus Superman. We'll be excited about Justice League when Justice League comes. We'll be super excited about it. But they realize that now, and they've got back to it, and they got back to it in a big, big way. And again, hear that silence? <laughs> All them critics, and everybody said, oh, they got Ben Affleck to play Batman. That's stupid. Yep, yeah, where are you now? I'm right, here and, now? I, I'm right here, and I was wrong. <laughs> the new thing about the trailer and that opening sequence, too, and no disrespect to Michael Keaton or Chris Nolan. I love them as Batman. This is the scariest Batman we've ever seen. Yes. That's the Batman you don't want to meet in a dark alley. Like him you, kicking those guys. I'm like, oh, I, see you later. You know? I don't know. When he grabbed the Christian Bale, where is he? <laughs> on top of the roof. And it also, it also feels like Alfred is like Michael Caine, but younger Michael Caine because he's still out yeah, there yeah. doing, helping out Batman with his mission. Now, John, you brought up earlier how excited everybody is for this movie. Uh, most of all, you. You're bringing far too much excitement and joy to the table right now. So <laughs> we're going to have to give you the boots. So you can go home and get a nap before Fine. Deadpool. Uh, I got other things to do anyway. Yeah, aren't you going to line up for Deadpool anyway? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get out of here. John is going to be kicked out. I told you guys this show keeps getting
getting better and better, and it's about to yet again. We're going to be joined by host Natasha Martinez, and the first story she has in line for us today that's in our show notes is about Sonic the Hedgehog, a beloved video game figure. And as far as we know, there's no blue hedgehogs that even exist in Canada, so you didn't really need John's take on that anyway. <laughs> Natasha, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy I get to talk about the most exciting news on today's show. <laughs> <laughs> We may still be waiting for the next great video game film, but that hasn't stopped studios from giving more gaming properties the green light. Back in 2014, it was announced that Sonic the Hedgehog would get his own movie. And yesterday, it was announced that Sega and Sony Pictures would be making a live-action CG, CG animation hybrid set for release in 2018. Dennis, will this film do justice to the world's fastest hedgehog? Well, in terms of the what the style they're saying, this hybrid of live-action and, and CG, I hate that style. I can't stand and it okay one movie cha didn't change my mind but i, I li actually like that the, sh the shit rats no 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 oh. paddington was the movie that i was like oh that actually was good but in general yeah the chipmunks the smurfs uh didn't like yogi bear have one they were all terrible it creeps me out when anytime i see that and, and also as, as someone who is a sega fanboy in the, in the 90s and i love sonic the hedgehog I don't understand why they're doing this because Sonic lives in his own world. He's got Tails, Knuckles, Dr. Robotnik. He has a whole cast of characters. He has his old world. Why? The only reason you do a hybrid is if they're in the modern world of today. Why do that? It doesn't make any sense. That's a great point. I loved the first Smurfs movie for about three minutes when we were in the Smurf village and we just got to be in their world, which is what I kind of wanted to get from Sonic the Hedgehog. It's a cool world. I remember playing that when I was when I first got Sega Genesis. I popped in Sonic the Hedgehog and it was like Super Mario Brothers on steroids. That's what I wanted. They added Tails in there and Tails was an even better addition <laughs> to Sonic. I'm like when they tried to throw Yoshi and Mario and it was a complete disaster in my humble opinion. So for a movie coming out, I can't really get behind Sonic the Hedgehog as a live-action CG animation because that seems to me like they're going to be marketing it clearly towards kids, not adults that are looking for nostalgia. It's going to be a children's kind of movie, a lot like the Smurfs, which does not work at all for an adult, or the Shit Rats, which do not work <laughs> for an adult at all. It's simply to bring your kids to. And then the question becomes, okay, is Sonic the Hedgehog still a property that little kids grow up playing? I'm very out of touch with the video game universe, so I'm not sure if there are still Sonic games being made or if it's going to be something they try to bring back into the public consciousness. Uh, I hate this idea. <laughs> I, I hate it. It's for the, all the reasons you're saying too, because and the fact that it's Sony who is responsible for the Smurfs. Um, I, I think that uh, it's it, it. The problem is that these people never watched Wreck It Ralph. Because if you watch Wreck It Ralph, that's where so, that's where Sonic that type of uh, atmosphere is where he should live. And I also hope that Roger Craig Smith is doing the voice, by the way, of of Sonic, but not Urkel. Was no no because uh, Urkel did the animated. I, I know one. Roger Craig Smith is 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 Sonic, but the other but the other thing that as it could work. Look, it could work if they if they don't try to do exactly what you're saying. Just turn it full kiddish, and if they actually want to play a little bit more. And I don't want to say Roger Rabbit because it just doesn't know. It doesn't really work in the Sonic universe because there's not a lot of humans running around in Sonic's universe, and they're gonna put it in the current. He's gonna be in New York City. He's gonna have to <laughs> zoom over a taxi cab. And there's gonna know? be poop and it's, fart jokes. It's and all like he doesn't understand the world. He's in his world for the, the first three minutes, just like Smurfs. Then he comes into New York or San Francisco, whatever it is, and it's just it's them go going. Oh, well, wouldn't it be so funny to see Sonic at an amusement park? Mm -hmm. No, it wouldn't put him in his regular atmosphere. That's that's. It's the same thing that happened, even though different universes, Gem and the Holograms. It's the same type of thing. Gem and the Holograms had its audience, had a different core story, and they wanted, well, let's make it for the YouTube generation. The movie was in theaters for three weeks. Um, Please stop that doing long? this. It was in there that Maybe. long? Maybe. Stop doing this. I mean, I'd like to think Sonic the Hedgehog has a better fan base. It's a little more loyal than Gem and the Holograms, but I could be mistaken. Yeah. And you make a great point with the studio it's going to be at is Sony Pictures, who is really looking for any sort of franchise tentpole they can get, whether it's kids coming to the theater or nostalgic adults. Either way, I think we need to see more before we can get any sort of confidence in this. Natasha, what's next? All of Battlestar Galactica may be happening again. According to reports, the popular TV franchise will be heading to the big screen in hopes of becoming a massive event franchise for Universal Studios. Producer Michael DeLuca is teaming up with Scott Suber and Dylan Clark to revive the property that ran as a critically acclaimed sci-fi series from 2004 to 2009. DeLuca most recently produced Fifty Shades of Grey and Dracula Untold. Christian, should Battlestar fans be getting their hopes up? Those last two titles. 
Man. Uh, <laughs> look, I love Battlestar Galactica. It's one of my favorite TV shows, the new ones. And uh, that scares me that Michael Dulek is doing it. It scares me a lot. Um, Fifty Shades of Grey and Dracula Untold, not good movies. Uh, so I, I don't know. Is Ron Moore not involved at all? We, I haven't heard his name in it. Uh, I'd like to have him involved. Yeah, so would uh, I. They, he clearly was the guy that knew how to bring this back. And, and because you look, there still hasn't been a show like that to be able to do it with the budget that they had to make it look that real and to add that kind of drama. Do I think that this could work? Absolutely. And I think it's ripe for a, for a big screen adaptation. I just, those two titles, you know, we're in a town, we're in a business that it's what have you done for me lately. That guy has not really given us anything to be excited about. It doesn't mean I'm not excited about the property, but I am very skeptical. Right. And to be fair, Michael DeLuca has a longer track record than just Fifty Shades of Grey and Dracula Untold. But you're right. What have you done for me lately? And lately you had a studio that wanted to make a tentpole franchise in Dracula and revive all these monster movies. And one of the guys responsible for that failure was Michael DeLuca. Now, look, truth be told, I'm not a huge Battlestar fan simply because I haven't taken the time to experience it yet. I, unlike somebody else at this table, have never canceled a date because I wanted to watch the next episode of <laughs> Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> But everything I hear from you Natasha, and Natasha, that was actually Natasha. Yeah. Natasha Canceling did that. Canceling dates that all the time. That poor bastard. <laughs> but look, it, it actually sounds like <laughs> one of the more reasonable excuses to cancel a date is because it's so full of not only human intrigue, but political things that are going on behind the scenes. And then you also have this epic space adventure on top of everything. It sounds like something that a lot of fans would line up to see if it was done right. But if it's not done right, I'm telling you this right now, the fans are going to be able to smell it from the very first first teaser trailer that comes out you're gonna know if you did it right or if you're heading down the toilet yeah i'm apprehensive because i don't know which way they're gonna go because the, i love the tv series just like christian did but that was kind of a dark gritty kind of more adult themed show are they gonna make this more of a you know a sci-fi sci series but more like polished and kind of like shiny and bright and, and we don't know because yeah. it, you know they're gonna sink a lot of money into this thing. They may go that route and try and get the mass audience. So we don't know. And yeah, Michael DeLuca, he's he had some stinkers lately, but he's also done some good stuff. He did a, a Moneyball, Social Network, and uh, Captain Phillips. So okay. it's not like he did like every movie he he produces is crap. He just you know he probably like you know has a hit and miss. Record. He's in the yes. business of making money, is what it sounds yes. like. But look at those those three movies that you the, the hits yeah. were like Oscar drama yeah. pieces that when he it's like it seems to be when he's going after the big budget kind of popcorn movies mm -hmm. that they're not working so far. So hopefully he can take what he did well with those other ones yeah. and add them to these popcorn. Now movies. let me put it to you guys: Can you make Battlestar Galactica as a mixture of a big budget popcorn summer fair, but also have that darker side to it, a lot like maybe what they want to do with Blade Runner too? Yeah, I think so. Inception did it. Inception had a big had, had a big summer feel to it, and was very kind of had deep. And I think when Inception came out in that in that summer season, everyone was like, "Oh, this is no, this should be an Oscar movie in like mm -hmm. November." And it wasn't. It had that skill. There, it, you, so, there's so many movies that, that have come out in the summertime that that blend. I mean, Winter Soldier did it. I thought too. So there, it can be done. All right. And then also, uh, we got to see who the director is because sure. I think Brian Singer was rumored around this project maybe a few years ago. In He's, 2014, he was rumored yeah. to be circling mm -hmm. it, and then he obviously got that revival with directing X Men films. So yeah. So it, it really depends on that. Either way, it looks like my girlfriend's gonna have to find another date for Valentine's Day. I got some TV to watch. Uh, now we are on to the part of the show called Buy or Sell. What we do here is Natasha is going to give us a premise, and we're simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. All right. A bevy of trailers have just dropped, and first up is The Purge 3 election year. When an idealistic young senator wants to put an end to the annual purge, it makes her a target by fellow politicians. Luckily, on her security team is Frank Grillo, whose badassery helped a band of survivors make it through the purge anarchy. Mark, buy or sell this new trailer for The Purge 3. Now, Natasha, I'll give you all my money for this trailer, and it's such a shame that this thing dropped yesterday, and I got some time to enjoy that and say that's my favorite trailer going right now. And then Batman versus Superman <laughs> happens, and everybody forgets all about The Purge 3. But you shouldn't sleep on it, and I'll tell you why. Because The Purge 2 anarchy kicked ass. The first Purge was meant as more of a horror movie, and as much as I love Ethan Hawke, it didn't really work for me in that setting. Once you made this movie a revenge tale with Frank Grillo going full-on Punisher mode on whatever streets that he was on, killing people that deserved it during The Purge, I loved watching that movie. It was one of the best action films that came out. So when you see this new trailer, 
what do you see? First of all, you need a different premise. You can't just keep doing the same sort of, okay, it's the purge. We're going to have some guys attacking some other guys. Here, finally, we see somebody in a position of power who wants to put an end to the purge. Because as interesting as a concept as it really is, you know that somebody would eventually want to say, hey, guys, what the hell are we doing here? I liked her backstory that we got from the trailer. And then once we see that Frank Grillo is back and he's on her security detail. Oh, my God. I love watching this. This movie is going to be one to watch later this year. Gentlemen, Christian, I'll start with you. You have not seen The Purge Anarchy, correct? I have not seen any of The Purges. You have not seen any of The Purges, no. but you saw this trailer because you're a good boy and do your research. Yes. What do you think? I. It makes me want to watch the, the first two. Uh, I like this trailer a lot. I like Frank Grillo. I think he's very underrated and a guy that I think is going to you're going to keep seeing more and more and more of him. What I liked, it, it reminded me, it had elements of uh, Running Man and Hunger Games, and uh, it just, it, it was, it's a movie to me, and Punisher, obviously, too, but, like, to see, I, I got, without seeing the first two, knowing what the premise was about, I got from the third one that it was an evolution of the first two movies. And I don't know, she is, and I don't know this, is she, the, the main, the senator, is she, like, related to the first movie no. at all? No, it's just kind of random that she's part of the purge? Okay, so that I wasn't sure about. So, but I it is do, interesting how the purge as it goes forward it's affected everybody's lives yeah no so i if like you were that kid and scared by it, you're gonna grow up and maybe want to make a change what i liked about this trailer that it, it was clear world building and mm -hmm. i think that there's there's more to come and and people are enjoying these movies and because they have kind of done what fast and furious did in where where it was and not, not to the the grand scale because it's a bigger franchise but they switched it. They turned it. It was a horror movie. And they turned it to an action, a, a kind of a hardcore action film too. And I think that that's what I'm more interested in too. But I do want to see the first two because I like to catch up on the franchise. Even though I tried to do it with Zoolander and Tuna. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely not Zoolander. No. Dennis, we're pulling our money in. Are you on board? Yeah, I'm buying this. And, and, and like you, I didn't care for the first one. It, it actually had a great concept, but I didn't think it delivered and executed well. I actually haven't seen the second one. But the good thing about this trailer is it makes me want to see the right. second mm -hmm. one. It's like hey, I want to fall, like for you, you haven't seen either one, you could skip the first one. The, I think, the, watch the second one, it'll be, I'm sure it'll yeah. be fine. But it's kind of a mix of the first two. You get the closed in space in the house first, and then you have the kind of like more road trippy type of purge action where they get out of there. So it's kind of a merge of that. Plus, I got I got a little kind of like White House down slash uh, Olympus has fallen. Right. He's got to protect her. Elizabeth Mitchell, who's from Lost, who I haven't seen in many, many things. I'm glad to see her there. That's right. It's very exciting for us here at Collider. Natasha, what are you dealing next? Also hitting the web is the first trailer for Mr. Right, starring Anna Kendrick and Sam Rockwell. In the Max Landis pen comedy, Kendrick falls for Rockwell characters despite the fact that he's a hitman. The film also stars Tim Roth as the FBI agent tracking the odd couple. Dennis, buy or sell this first trailer for Mr. Right? I'll buy it. I'm a big fan of Sam Rockwell, so I'll see anything he's in. Um, Anna Kendrick's cool, too. Uh, the trailer, I don't think it was amazing or anything like that, but it, it got me interested enough. It kind of reminded me. Do you remember uh, Gross, Gross Point, Point Blank? Blank? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah John Cusack and Mini Driver, where he plays that hitman and he falls in love. So I, I've been hearing there's a lot of good buzz that people have been seeing it at uh, film festivals. So I'm going to buy it. It's a buy for me, too, because Sam Rockwell is so magnetic in whatever he's doing. And it's, it's funny that you cast these two because Anna Kendrick, her character, it seems ridiculous that you'd find out this guy is killing people. For whatever reason, he's killing people. Even if he thinks it's noble, this is not the Purge world, okay? This is a totally different universe. So you'd think you would run the other direction from that. But it seems like Anna Kendrick just has that magic about her where you actually believe that she wants to stay and you're on board with her. Now, conversely, when you look at Sam Rockwell's character, that guy could be a murderer, and I would still like him. He just has that charisma on screen in whatever he's in that I'm going to want to buy this movie, and I definitely buy this trailer. Uh, I buy it as well, too, and it's because I thought of Gross Point Blank immediately when I was watching it, and and instead of going, ah, just remaking Gross Point Blank, I went, oh, okay, this is a take with Sam Rockwell, because for that reason, I, I'm a big Sam Rockwell fan as well, and I like Max Landis's writing, man. I mean, I, I know that I'm, I'm one of the few, but I, I really enjoyed American Ultra for the kind of wackiness that it was, and he, Max Landis, I think, works in the absurd very well, and I think that that's why you can buy Anna Kendrick from the writing, and you're going to have some kind of crazy dialogue and some really nutty uh, action and violence in this movie but the question is can they do it fresh and I think that they can 
but it's the cast that gets you in there, not over, because the premise has been done before. But I still buy the trailer. I thought it looked a lot of fun. There's been so many trailers we've already talked <laughs> about today, and we bought every one of them. Boys, it's like 4 a.m. in Vegas, and we're thinking about going in for one more hand. Natasha, let's do it. Spin the wheel. A new trailer for the Sasha Baron Cohen and Mark Strong comedy, The Brothers Grimsey, has been released. The Red Band clip showcases Cohen as the dim-witted but well-meaning brother of Spy Strong. When they reconnect after decades apart, apart all hell breaks loose christian buy or sell the new red band trailer for the brothers grimsey well just like vegas we stayed at the table way <laughs> too long uh i'm gonna sell it man i've been selling these trailers since they've been coming uh, out i still think though even with the red band trailer i still think that there's a shot that i don't like i haven't liked any of these trailers and i go in this movie is hysterical because i like everyone involved I think that they're getting scared now, too, because this is the first time they opened up with him as Ali G and Borat to let people know because they, they must have been not tracking at all and people are not caring about it. And they're like, no, but look, we have Borat, we, 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 Ali G. And then you go, oh, oh, that's what they want audiences to do because no one really cares right now from the way I'm gathering. Um, I didn't think a lot of the jokes were that funny. I thought that there was a lot of easy jokes. I've seen the, the one, the rapist joke I've seen from Saturday Night Live. They pulled it right out of Phil Hartman's mouth. Um, there, there's jokes that I've seen happen a million times. Nothing seemed fresh. A and even, you know, the I still think the chemistry between Strong and Cohen could be really great. These trailers aren't doing it for me. It was Daryl Hammond as Sean Connery and the right, rapist right, on Celebrity not, not, right, right, And you know right, what? Right. That, is, that was the linchpin that made me have to sell this trailer. And I didn't want to because I laughed more watching this trailer than I did the other uh, Brothers Grimsby trailer. It's just that you're right. It opens and it opens with an air of desperation that it's like, hey, look at this guy's greatest hits. Here's his entire career. And now we're putting him in this. I like that they put the focus on Sasha Baron Cohen because, look, Mark Strong's great. Mark Strong is never going to open a movie for me where I'm like, oh, I need to go see Mark Strong play a spy i will however go see cohen do something that's in the comedy realm and that's what i want from this trailer i got a lot of it i did laugh at some of the jokes but you're right ending on a joke like that where it's just it's not just something that we've seen before it's kind of in the public consciousness so why would you bother putting it in a the movie and b the trailer when it just seems like you're really selling us a little too hard i gotta sell as well I'm going to sell it big time. Same reasons as you guys. I actually like that first teaser one that they came mm -hmm. out with a few months ago. I think it was only a minute long. But this one, it is desperation is the key word here. Why would you set up the movie with the one of the main actors and show like something that has nothing to do with this movie? That's like a Will Ferrell movie coming out. Like, remember, he was awesome in Saturday Night Live or right. like showing all this other stuff. And then, oh, here you go. Here's the movie. So I. I actually didn't like most of the jokes in this one. I just thought it was too kind of like dick and fart jokes. And, yeah. and I, I don't know. that I think they're just really desperate. No one's talking about this movie, and, and they're just like grasping at straws. Yeah. I mean, look, if you lose all your money in Vegas, at least save a couple bucks in your pocket so you can enjoy our next segment called Opening This Week, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is a showcase as to all the movies that are coming out this week. Weekend. Now, earlier this week, we already talked about Zoolander 2, but Despair Christian, we're not going to go over that movie again. We're going to talk about Deadpool and how to be single. Natasha, let her rip. Deadpool, Wade Wilson, plays by, played by Ryan Reynolds, is a former Special Forces operative who now works as a mercenary. His world comes crashing down when the evil Ajax, played by Ed Skrein, tortures, disfigures, and transforms him into Deadpool. The rogue experiment leaves Deadpool with accelerated healing powers and a twisted sense of humor. With help from mutant allies, Negasonic, Teenage Warhead, and Colossus, Deadpool uses his new skills to hunt down the man who nearly destroyed his life. And how to be single. After four years of college, young Alice, played by Dakota Johnson, decides she needs a break from her long-term boyfriend, Josh. Excited and ready for new challenges, the eager grad moves to New York to take a job as a paralegal. Helping her navigate her way through an unfamiliar city is Robin, played by Rebel Wilson, a fun-loving, wild co-worker who enjoys partying and one-night stands. With Robin as her freewheeling guide, Alice can now learn how to get free drinks, meet men, and enjoy the single lifestyle. Christian, do I even need to ask which movie you're planning to see this weekend? Uh, no, you do not. You got, because here's the thing. You take two movies, um, both movies that have are in a genre that is being done a lot now. You get Deadpool in the comic book genre. You get the romantic comedy genre here with, uh, or the romantic genre with Dakota Johnson and Rebel Wilson. 
the comic book movie is the one that does it different and doesn't fall into the cliches and doesn't see you know you see so much different stuff in Deadpool it's so original like John was just talking about before um, and and the interview with he, that he had with the writers that they did such a great job with setting it up to where like okay there's the there's the origin story oh but it's done in a different way the style of Tim Miller it is a movie to me that just it delivered on every promise it said it was going to deliver on it delivered how to be single is a movie that if you're if you're at home and you're on and it pops up on cable and you just happen to stumble upon it on a date you know you're gonna you're gonna stay home and you're gonna watch uh, <laughs> forget it uh, you're, ah, you're, well, I was gonna I was gonna go somewhere but I, decided so well. to, I was gonna go, go somewhere to and I didn't place. I'm not gonna do it but you're just you're just home and you're watching it. By the way, Rebel Wilson is falling into the same shit over and over and over. It's like the thing with between her and um, what's her face? Uh, train wreck. Help me. Schumer. Amy Schumer. Amy Schumer. Now, Amy Schumer, even though I'm not a huge fan of Amy Schumer, what she did in train wreck is she she combined what she does in her stand up and which being offensive and anything too, she added heart and she added something into that role. There was a real character. There was development of who she was. Rebel Wilson does not do that. She just relies on the jokes, and none of these characters are memorable at all. Dennis Christian just had a great compare contrast paper and hinted at something very dark and twisted that he does in his apartment late at night. Yes. <laughs> Which one are you going to see this weekend? Well, I haven't seen uh, How to Be Single yet, and actually, I, I didn't mind the trailers. I looked at it's just not, not my terrible. Th- it's not a terrible okay. movie. It's just it's it's just it, it it is. Yeah, it's 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 not something I'm like oh I got to go rush out and see it. Right. But it, yeah, if if it's on Netflix or something on cable. Maybe I'll watch, tune in and see, you know, entertain me for, for an hour and a half. But yeah, Deadpool, Deadpool is obviously the one. It's a blast. It's fun to watch. It's obviously a hard R. It's different, like you said. And, and you guys can check out our, we're doing our, we already did our spoilers review, but it's going to come out tomorrow. Tomorrow, we'll do it in the morning or in the afternoon, release it. You guys can check that out. But we all loved it. You know, Schnepp was like over the moon for yeah. it. John's, we're, we're going to go see it again tonight. And I think it, it's something, as long as you're not easily offended, Ended, I, it's something I definitely recommend people see. And we're not just dudes here hanging out talking about Deadpool. Natasha, can I ask you, which one of these movies would you be more interested in seeing this weekend? I mean, you guys may bring John back in my seat when I answer this question, but I'm totally going to go see How to Be Single because, like, I have a ton of single girlfriends, and that's what we're going to do this weekend. So, hey, and I like Rebel Wilson. I think I like her, too, but I just think she's falling into the same shtick, and that's that's the thing is that uh, her point alone of the you go there because if you're going single girls going to watch the movie, I don't think you relate to anyone. I don't think any of the I don't think any of the characters were realistic. That's to me like I wouldn't mind to see like because I actually I I agree with you. I like the first trailer. I'm like, okay, let's let's see if we got a lot of laughs out of it. And like I said, I could watch that movie a hundred times in a row than watch ten more minutes of Zoolander two. <laughs> um, so it's it's again, it's 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 watchable. Right. I just can't look at how to be single as anything other than a Valentine's Day cash grab. Like they got together, and they're like we're gonna make a movie, and yeah. if it doesn't open on a Valentine's Day, we're kind of screwed. Now I could be wrong, but you could also I can understand the perspective of somebody else looking at Deadpool and saying, well, it's just another comic book movie. But I'll tell you this, it's not just another comic book movie. It is singular in its vision. It's something unlike anything I've ever seen before, and I've seen pretty much all the comic book movies kids so check out Deadpool in theaters this weekend so now we're going to move on to mailbag now remember if you guys ever want to get a question answered on air all you have to do is write into us at collidervideo at gmail.com and maybe your question is going to get read on this here show and look we're we're not supposed to do it this late but I'm going to go ahead and open up the Twitter floodgates real quick if you want to get a question read live on Twitter on this show just tweet us right now at collidervideo and Natasha might be able to get a couple of them I'm running the show today I'm going to run this ship into the ground before I let the fans (laughs) voices go unheard so natasha let's go to mailbag who's up first dc bowling writes what's up guys i watch movie talk every day after my classes and even when even watching it on wednesday made me feel better my question is what movies do you feel have gotten massive backlash over the years for me it's movies like the dark knight rises star trek into darkness and forrest gump are some that i think are still great what do you guys think you know i love the forrest gump uh mention the dc had in there because it seems like everybody's so pissed off that shawshank redemption didn't win best picture that year and they act like Forrest Gump is really just some dude sitting on a bench Forrest Gump's a great movie in my opinion I love watching Forrest Gump now Shawshank Redemption is pretty special too and I revisited 
just recently. It's it's that good. I think they're neck and neck. I might give the slight edge to Shawshank, but it's no reason to hate on Forrest Gump. Dennis, what are some other movies that you think have gotten an unfair backlash over the uh, years? Well, first of all, I love the picture that Ray picked for, for this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it, it represents uh, kind of the mob mentality of the internet. Uh, along with the ones that he mentioned, which are all ones that do get backlash, uh, Iron Man 3, Age of Ultron, and Man of Steel. Those are movies that, that people get really passionate about, about how much they hate. Li all the ones he listed and the ones I listed, though, they're all, from the general public's point of view, well-received, including a, another recent one, which was The Force Awakens. But you get these very vocal fan base that, like, it's it's a small part, but they just have this huge, and they make the backlash seem like bigger than it actually is. Christian, did they? Did he did he mention Avatar and Gravity? No. There? no. Okay, those are two as well too, and I think that and it goes into the Force Awakens thing. It's like once a movie starts to become this juggernaut with money, Titanic's another one as well too. Once it starts to really build with money and popularity. It's a rehash. Mm -hmm. It's a rehash. Force Awakens <laughs> is just a rehash. I hate everything. Yeah, and that's kind of what happens. Um, so, you know, whether and Gravity was the same thing. Avatar was the same thing. I, I enjoyed those movies when they came out. I enjoy them today. I like The Dark Knight Rises. I like Man of Steel a lot as well. Um, but yeah, there comes there, after a while, people start talking about them. And then, like you said, it's that mob mentality to where if people start hating it, then other people yeah. start hating it. And just, and I'm not taking it away from anyone who saw the movie originally and said, I hated it. I just didn't like the movie. It didn't like, from That was your first initial thought. It's it's when it just starts to become shtick yeah. to, to hate on a movie. Right, and sometimes people, just because a movie isn't great, it's merely good, they want to hate on it too. I think that was the case with Anchorman 2. Was it as good as the first one? No, but it still made me laugh throughout, so I'd throw it on the backlash list as well. What's up next? Kanea Williams writes, Hey Collider, it was recently announced that Creed 2 was slated for a November 2017 release, which put the film in direct competition with Thor Ragnarok opening on the 3rd and the first Justice League film opening on the 17th. Should Creed 2 stay in the November month or be push to October to avoid the chance of not getting destroyed or be in the middle between two separate superhero films. I don't think a boxing film can handle that, and Rocky is too old to be in the middle of that as well. What are your thoughts? Thanks. Well, first of all, we want to be clear that there hasn't been any official word that I could find as to a release date for Creed 2, or even that Creed 2 has officially been greenlit. Maybe you boys can shed some light on that, but as far as I know, there has not been an official release date listed. It would make sense if they were going to release it in 2017 to do a lot like the first one did and make it around Thanksgiving. I don't think it would be that affected. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of people that want to go see Thor and want to go see Justice League, but Creed did very well critically and financially, and so there's a group of people that's pretty massive that want to go see more in the adventures of Adonis Creed, and in reference to Rocky being too old, Stallone still hasn't said he's going to come back or that well, he, he even did. wants to. He said he would, if Cougar comes back, he said that he would think about it, but I don't think he's, he, he, there's a chance he doesn't come back at all, right? There was just an article that came out yesterday that yeah. said that he and I think maybe it was in Santa Barbara where he, he said that he thinks Rocky's story is done. Not that Creed's story is done, but he thinks Rocky's story is done. And Rock, I mean, if, if you haven't seen the end of Creed, there's a particular scene at the end where he's something I don't want to spoil it for anybody but basically something happens at the end where he thought that was the perfect way mm -hmm. for, it, for it to end. And so I think we don't know if he's going to... I still think they're going to get him back. I think you need him because... It, you Stallone want him, has said no and then had his mind yeah, changed you, before. you got to get so. him back. because It's, it's, it's going to be after the script as well, too. But yeah, he's got he's like the Mickey of the of this Creed franchise. And I think that even though Creed proves himself as like, you know, he could stand on his own in the film and in, in box office stuff, too, I still think you need him for the second one. But... Um, I don't know if that means that he, that it should move because I think that depending on who directs it, on who writes it, it looks like they're trying to do some Oscar pushes with it. That it, they, they're focused. It's more of a movie that focuses on the story and the characters, and those types of stories do well in November and December. So I I don't really think it should move. Dennis, I don't think it should move either, as long as it's not on the exact date of let's say Justice League or Thor. Also, I know that it's probably hard for people to com some people to comprehend. There's some people out there who actually don't care for superhero comic book movies. What? Yeah, it's, what? it's crazy. What? It's crazy. So there's a contingent of people who don't really care for those movies, and they they're looking forward to Creed. So if Creed comes around, uh, Creed Two comes out around that same time, they're they're looking forward to it. It was a, a big movie. The second one should be bigger. So I, I don't think they should, you know, 
move around their their release date just because of that. It'd be great to see Kugler come back. The guy, the fact that he got stolen in the movie in the first place means he should be a director slash hostage negotiator. He's that good at sitting down and talking to people and convincing them to do something. Maybe they were reluctant to do it first, but also Kugler is going to be having a full slate as well. Yeah. So maybe that pushes Creed 2 back even further. Regardless, I think we'd all love to see it come out whenever it does. Okay, kids. Well, I promised you we'd take some of your live Twitter questions, and I think I've managed to squeeze two in there. Natasha, do you have two ones that are going to be worth us running a little bit over time? I do. All right. This one, the name is just worth going over time. Deadpool's crotch writes, <laughs> <laughs> will the shared movie right universe <laughs> ever stop? Universal Monsters, Hasbro, G.I. Joe, Call of Duty, etc. It's too much. Love the show. If you're asking about whether shared universes will stop and adding on to already existing properties, if that's the question, I don't think you're going to see it stop anytime soon. But, you know, sometimes it is nice to just see a standalone vehicle. But you can have those. Like, I would go with something like John Wick. I don't think John Wick is going to cross over anywhere. And that wasn't a known franchise going into the movie. But it's not like John Wick is going to team up with, say, The Purge, Frank Grillo, and they're just going to go on some mission together. So I like seeing team-ups. I agree with you. I can totally understand that it can feel oversaturated when you have the expendable coming out here and the Avengers and the Justice League and all this other stuff but it's also these are things that a guy like me and guys of our age have dreamed about seeing since I was a kid when I got a toy I didn't want to just play with that individual toy I wanted to see what my G.I. Joes would do if they met up with Transformers and if Transformers met up with He-Man did He-Man kick all their asses of course he did he's Prince Adam but it is cool to see that stuff Dennis are we are we finally at the at the at the point when it's just too much of shared universes no, because they're still doing well. I mean, you have Marvel, and they're the ones who kicked off the whole shared universe thing. And, and so as long as that's successful and the DC's doing theirs and that's successful, everyone's going to want to copycat that. I mean, that's that's kind of the industry, right? Like if something's popular and successful at the box office, they're going to copy that. And I, I don't really know if the Universal Movie Monster 1 really needs a shared universe, but they're going to do it anyways. Christian uh, George. But Dennis. Um, the, the, <laughs> in regards to the shared universe, Marvel, I think it was the first one to really build the mega success yes. off of it because Tarantino and, and Kevin Smith were kind of doing they it in their, their movies. Own. Yeah, but in, in, a, in a much smaller way. Um, but yeah, Marvel's the one who's really made it big and kind of got the other studios on board to do it. And now, I don't want it to stop. I want to see as long as it's done well, and I think that it could be. I want to see it done outside of the comic book universe. You know, I want to see how it happens here with the with the monsters, the monster universe, and see if they can do it in other ways. Because I always thought, like, not that this will ever happen, but like, there's been talk and fan hype of Bourne and and Bond being in the same franchise. That to me could be an interesting thing. Like certain shared universes that you maybe never dreamed of and you saw two of your favorite movie characters because back in the day there was always talk about what if uh, the uh, John Ma John Matrix from Commando and Rambo fought and stuff like like th all those types of things are where we hope and wish that these things that happen are possible depending on which studios have which properties so uh, both men took down an entire country by themselves okay yep. one more Twitter question but we each only get like one sentence to answer all Natasha right, right. go okay Sierra Dune asks with Deadpool being made for 50 million and looking like it will be amazing how can Fox justify 150 plus million budget for Gambit. I don't know that they can. I know that that's probably something that they're talking about right now is like, look at Deadpool and look at what we did for that amount of money. Gambit, you could probably you could probably save some dollars in your bank account. Just look at what Deadpool did and that's your template. I'll tell you how they justify it. They move it like they did and they restructure <laughs> like they're doing. They are, they're aware of it already because they can't, you, you can't, I mean, I, the thing is, another reason why, and they pretty much make joke of it in Deadpool, is because of probably who they cast, all the people that they cast in Gambit and the amount of money that they're spending for things that aren't even the actual production of the movie. Like it's, you know, the, the, the cast and how much Channing Tatum costs alone. Um, so I think they need to drop certain things, not, not him, but they need to just drop certain things and not put their priority so much on this big, glossy, big movie. Make it a smaller movie because it's a smaller property. And like the, the viewer just asked, Deadpool just did it. You can do it for 50, 60 million, especially for a movie that's starting out. Spend the money on the sequel. What does the term one sentence mean to you? <laughs> you did three. You did three. I, 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 think, I think they should curb and, and put the budget. 150 is way too much for Gambit. But I also hope that, that, that other studios or other movies learn uh, not to copy Deadpool. Deadpool is unique, right? You can't take any character, you can't take Gambit and go, we're gonna make him R, and then right. we're gonna have him say like foul things, and uh, like don't do that, but learn the lessons of how Deadpool took uh, you know, a significantly smaller budget and, and, and made it, stretch it out and made it 
look a lot bigger than it actually was. Great points, ladies and gentlemen. Well, look, I want to thank everybody who participated in this episode of Movie Talk. It was Collider Jam 2016 in here. <laughs> Most prominently, the guys that hung in with me until the end. Dennis Zhang. Dennis, where can the kids find you? You can find me on Twitter at Think Hero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Christian Harloff? At Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram, and on Jedi Council. That's going down today. Myself, John, this character won't be there again, but if you... Might pop you in. might pop in? You might pop in. All right, so at Christian Harloff, and make sure you also hashtag Collider Jedi Council to get some of your questions on the air. And Miss Natasha Martinez. You guys can find me on Instagram at Natasha A. Martinez and on Twitter at Natasha Lexus underscore. We also want to give a special thanks to the writers of Deadpool for joining John Campia here. And we want to thank John Campia for giving his thoughts not only on that, but also the Batman versus Superman trailer that a lot of you guys are giving us your thoughts about as well. Hey, make sure you guys, you want to see a movie this weekend, go to amctheaters.com for all your tickets and showtime information. If you want to send a question, remember, just go to Collider Video at G gmail.com and feel free to tweet us at collider video at any time for the gang here for everybody behind the camera working so hard behind the scenes wendy dennis who's actually right here <laughs> jonathan my name is mark ellis i'll be at the comedy store in la jolla california this weekend you can get tickets at my website mark that's also my twitter handle until next time see you guys tomorrow Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.